All right. So thanks again, everyone, for for coming. Um, we do appreciate you taking the time to to join us here for our second webinar for the Fit for Disruption Do Business Differently with Matt Weber. Um, I just wanted to do a bit of housekeeping to begin with. Can everyone hear me? Can you raise your hand? There's a button to raise your hand. Can you all raise your hand that you can hear me? Yep, okay. It certainly looks like everyone can hear me, which is great. Um, now there is a, just again on the housekeeping side, there is a Q&A control button. So if you have any questions throughout the session, feel free to click that. Uh, and we will be running a couple polls as we go as well. Uh, the Q&A session we'll deal with at the end of the, the webinar. Matt and I will, uh, I have a couple questions I want to ask back for the group as well. Uh, but if you have anything you'd like us to address, we can certainly do it there too. Okay, so, um, all right, so let, let's get started. Um, again, we're here to talk about Matt's new book, Fit for Disruption, Do Business Differently. Um, now, before we jump into Matt, for those who don't know myself uh, and Bastion Consulting, um, I am the owner of Bastion Consulting. We are a boutique search business that covers primarily the supply chain function across Asia Pacific. I myself have been doing search in this space for about 10 years now. Um, and that's actually how uh, I came across Matt. Um, Matt was a client of mine back in 2014 when he used to work for Target uh, out of the Hong Kong office. And I actually recruited someone into Matt's team, um, Joyce Chen. And now we've just kept in contact ever since then. And you know, and as relationships develop over time, they can take a many a paths. But I'm certainly very fortunate and um, happy that we're at this point now with Matt and here to talk about this book. Uh, for those who don't know Matt, I'm just gonna read a quick intro. Um, Matthew brings over 20 years of international experience leading large scale operations, finance and commercial functions and transformation programs. He has worked across the globe with large organizations undergoing immense change, developing and applying the principles of the fit for disruption model. Matt holds a Bachelor of Business from Monash University and has completed the Sanford Lee program in corporate innovation. He is also the founder of the Menar Group, a specialist strategy program and delivery training organization that is focused on driving business performance by developing commercial, operational and innovation capability. The Menart Group trans transforms with profitable impact, builds enduring capability. So that's a bit about Matt. Now I'm just going to pass it over to him, and he's going to walk us through, you know, why he wrote this book, the context, and the the principles of the big book and the model. And I hope you enjoyed as much as I have. So Matt, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, obviously, thank you for. For, for having me and, and giving me the chance to to talk about fit for disruption um, uh, but but also thank you for the for the kind words and and for the for the introduction um, as you mentioned uh, you know we've known each other for a number of years so um, and you're right you know the, the relationships take on on a different path and and uh, we're very lucky to have a, a great friend and partner in yourself so thank you uh, thank you for having me on. Um, hope everyone is safe and well. Um, I know it's tough times out there and I, I do want to thank everyone um, for taking the time to join today. It's, um, it, it's, it's um, you know, I, I gather for most people, you're going to have uh, lots of priorities and demands uh, at the moment. So if you're taking some time out of your busy schedules to, um, to, to see if you can, um, to glean any, um, support or information um you know that's not lost on me so I'll, I'll certainly i'll certainly do my best to hopefully have you walk away with uh, in a better position than what you were when you started but i, I sincerely do hope everything is well for um uh, from for everyone uh, out there i will um must i say in melbourne it is absolutely freezing today I'm, um it was certainly out of summer so um so the woolies have certainly come out um but today, what I did want to do is um, is talk about the book and talk about why I wrote the book, uh, and then I'll, I do, we you know we'll touch on COVID nineteen and and how that fits into it because this book was written pre COVID nineteen, so I do want to place that into context, 
And then as Tony said, I'll, I'll talk through uh, what the model uh, is and the book and the, the attributes that, that and the model that sits under the book. But importantly, at the end, we'll have a, um, I do want to throw a little bit of a challenge out um, out to this group. So hopefully we can get, um, um, you know, get people into a positive mindset and, and also into an action state. Um, you know, again, making sure that we make the most out of, uh, out of this time. Um, okay, just quickly, um, before we, before I talk about uh, the disruptive world, well, it sort of blends into this, I guess. Why did I write the book? I think there's, um, you know, it's, it's been a long, uh, it's, it's been something I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, but the particular topic um, around fit for disruption definitely came um, because I could see that, um, and this is pre-COVID, mind you, so remember I'm writing this before any of this happened, and I'm sitting there and watching the exponential growth rate of, of the change that is coming through. And, and, I, and I really felt that uh, I was watching organisations and, and leaders of organisations either um, not have the level of awareness that they needed um, to, to be able to respond, or if they did have the right level of awareness that their world is being disrupted, that they had the right tools and, and uh, frameworks to be able to respond uh, to respond to the um, to the challenges ahead, so that was that was very much a, a driving uh, a driving force and behind writing the book and 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 if if we talk about um, what some of the disruptions are that I that I discuss in the book, um, weirdly very weirdly in the first draft and it got cut. I actually spoke I actually spoke about how would the um, how would the World Health Organization deal with a pandemic? And um, that never made the cut. And I'm sort of glad it didn't. Um, but the, 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 um, the disruptions that I was talking about, you know, may seem fairly obvious, um, but they, they include things like um, digitization and, and technology. And a lot of these, particularly for a lot of the, the people on this call that are supply chain, focused and centric, it, it has a particular meaning um, to everyone. Um, you know, digitization could be around visibility systems, technology, it could be robotics. Um, but then there's um, disruptions around globalization. And we, we only had to see what happened recently with Trump or, um, you know, America and China, uh, you know, they, they, you know, sort of started off on their trade wars and what that disruption um, uh, was looking like. And there's, um, changing in sourcing patterns and, and new emerging economies coming on, on board. Then we have this, this now economy, you know, now everything's digitized and we've got access and information. So um, where do you, you know, so people, people can, people want things and they want it now. And, and, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, just, I just look at my children and, and the access that they, they have, they have, you know, even even if it's not materialistic, even if it's even if it's information. Like I look at when I, my my son's doing year twelve this year, and I remember when I did year twelve, and if I wanted to do particular research, and I had to catch a bus into the library. It took me an hour to get to the library, and, and sort of, and then I had to find the book. And you know, now my son doing year twelve just jumps on Google and and find, well, he's actually being homeschooled, or not homeschooled. He's been learning you know, remotely. So it just shows how, how different things are. Um, we've got a customer driven economy. So definitely the customers driving, driving the outcomes, whereas before it might've been a little bit more supplier led. And then we have everything from the, the, the gig and contract and economy, you know, all the Ubers and um, all, all the, all the delivery apps and, and, and all the, all those types of things coming on. It's, a, it's really a new way of working and, and it's going to throw up new challenges. Um, as, as, um, and, and the other one I've got here is the flexible, flexible hours, you know, and, and, and flexible work arrangements and, you know, how that's come into the fro in the last month or so. But, you know, before that, it was certainly ramping up anyway. And I think that will change forever now, by the way. I, I was speaking to my wife's boss, no, I wasn't speaking to my wife's boss. I was speaking to my wife about her boss. And she, he, he was saying, um, 
as she was saying about how he, you know he was sort of a little bit anti all this work from home and and now that he's had a taste for it he's the biggest advocate he's like a reform smoker so he sort of he talks it uh, he talks it up then we have aging work for uh, aging workforce or millennials you know really shape, reshaping the way that we're working so there's all the, there's all that disruption pre covid so what does that what does all that mean and i think a lot of that means is around having you know the right mindset and having the, the the right tools and capabilities to be able to respond. But most of all, we need to be uh, adaptable and adaptable in our approach. Um, COVID-19, uh, COVID so it, as I, I think I mentioned before, I wrote this book, I wrote this book before, um, before the COVID event and it was basically done and dusted um, uh, I actually know the date for another reason, which, which was the, the 4th of January that this book was done, dusted, um, the editing had been done, the, the naming, everything had been sorted other, other than the, the printing. Um, so even for, you know, the book itself has even been disrupted and the, the trajectory that I said, you know, that, that we were on and the exponential change, it's just been put onto a whole new, uh, it's on a whole new level now, and um, and it, and it has disrupted. It's disrupted everything. It's disrupted everything about about our lives. Um, and, and it is that look. There's there's obviously a very serious part to this, and and you know there's obviously been loss of flow. And I want to recognise that. Um, and I'm not at all trying to when I when I start talking about the opportunities amongst it. I, I'm certainly not trying to dismiss the seriousness of what's happened and the, the pain and suffering that many people have, um, have endured. Um, I think I, I, I do want to though move into the direction of it, it has happened, our world has changed. And for any of us that think for a moment that life will be like it was pre-COVID, we're, we're mistaken. Things, things have changed some not for so not for good reason or not for not for good but but many many good things will come off this and it may even be the acceleration of digitization as as um as the example um we need calm and and reassuring leadership and decisive leadership through this time people people are looking for really really strong leadership and and the people on this call have a very unique um part to play in, in providing that leadership um, it's also because these are really uncharted territory, uh, uncharted waters. Um, and as leaders, it's really, really important. This has never been done before. Um, so it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to, and now more than ever, should we be working together to, to, to get an outcome. And, and I, I, I'm quite optimistic that I believe that will come out, um, much, much better and stronger for it. There are opportunities in amongst this, and I know for men, I know for many people that will be hard to see. Um, but you know, I use the examples, and I know it's slightly different. But Air, for an, for example, Airbnb and um, and Uber were created through the global financial crisis. Um, Shakespeare wrote Macbeth through a plague. Um, and even Sir Isaac Newton um, developed the theory of gravity um, through a pandemic. So certainly can, some good can come if we uh, apply our minds to it. So that leads us, um, so that's, that's COVID-19. We'll touch a bit more about that on the opportunity um, towards the end. So what I want to do now is I want to quickly talk to you about what the attributes are of the fit for disruption model. The book talks firstly about what the disruption is, but then, then it gets into the, the, the you know, 80% of the, of the book, which is about, well, how do you respond to that? What is the framework? And there are three attributes and three for very good reason. Um, to, you know, it needs to be simple and, and, and we need to be able to um, break it down. But, but these, these ultimately become um, what's important and, and are the, and, and even without the fit for disruption uh, book, I watch leaders and organisations and those ones that are successful um, have, have really mastered these three, um, these three attributes. 
the one point I do want to make, it doesn't matter where you are in your business today. So you can be unprofitable, you can be big, small, um, you could have massive COVID challenges. You may, um, it, it would depend, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you are. You could be in Hong Kong, Europe, Australia, you could be a training organisation, a big supply chain organisation. The principles are the same uh, for all and it doesn't matter where you start. And it isn't about being perfect, it's about progression. It's about continuous improvement and, and working towards um, improvement. So the three attributes, the first is um, about being commercial. Um, no surprises, this is, I come from a finance background. So I started my life as an accountant um, and then worked my way through into, into many supply chain roles and, um, and leadership, operational and leadership roles. Um, but this is very much about setting a base and setting the foundation. And if you have good commercial foundations, your business um, is, is well positioned to be fit for disruption. There's no, no point creating really big fancy solutions and, you know, if you can't make it happen um, or if you can't, um, you know, if you can't solve your customer problems. So you need to be commercial to start with. The second is around, um, is around creating solutions. So um, that's, that's creating solutions um, for your customers, not, not for yourself. Um, because ultimately value is, is through the eyes of um, customers. And the third attribute is affecting change. You know, we're very, very good at talking about things and pontificating and, and, and coming up with great, great ideas. But unless it's done, it's not done. Like it has to happen and it needs to be led. So, um, so affecting change becomes uh, critically, uh, critically important making it happen, getting it done. Um, so then I'll jump into, I'll jump into a slightly some more detail on the first attribute, which was the commercial. So this was around, remember, around setting a foundation. And the first element of that is around developing a strategy. That's very much the, um, the why, the what, the how. Um, it's about setting a North Star. And a really, really important point to, to make here is, and, and we would have seen it in COVID, you can't have a strategy that's fixed. You need, it just needs to be a North Star. You, you, you need your plan, but you also need to be able to pivot based upon, um, based upon what's uh, happen, happening around you. And the organisations that are going to be doing particularly well or are surviving well under the circumstances are the ones that are going to be very, very clear on why they exist. Because if they know why they exist, they know what problems they're solving and they know who they're solving them for and then they can really then work with their, their customer base to, um, um, to, you know, to, to get through these tough times. The second element of the commercial attribute is around having a, a, a governance framework. And without going into too much of this, I liken it to a Formula One car. A Formula One car is obviously goes very, very, very quick. They are probably one of the most innovative products um, created. Um, I mean, they can change a four, you know, four sets, the whole set of tyres on a Formula One car in, in less than two seconds. But unless they had systems and processes and brakes and controls, none of that would be possible. So um, building a, a governance framework is super important. The next element is around de uh, developing business intelligence capability. And that is simply measuring the, the right things right and, and, getting, uh, and getting great visibility to be able to affect great decision making. The fourth is around um, making every dollar account. And this isn't about being the Scrooge and, and type because, um, because you can actually erode value by, by, by being a Scrooge. This is talking about eliminating waste. Things that don't matter, you know, or don't add value should be eliminated from your business. Um, but, but equally, like I was saying before, don't be penny wise, pound foolish. You have to make sure that if you are cutting or if you are eliminating waste rather, that you are not eliminating value. And that's, um, that's a really important distinction um, to make. So that's the, um, that's the commercial model. What we, um, uh, what I wanted to do now is just quickly touch on, um, uh, of 
I've got a couple of case studies in here. I'll, I'll touch on them very quickly, very, very high level, just to bring home some points. And I want to use Blockbuster as an example. Blockbuster were founded in 1985. They, in 1994, they had a valuation of some $8.4 billion. So then in the late 90s, 97, Netflix was created. And in the year 2000, and it's, and it's a bit of a, a legend that gets around that this story actually happened, that the, the Netflix business was offered to Blockbuster for $50 million to, to buy um, with, a, um, with an understanding that the Netflix guys would help them, would help Blockbuster also um, deal with the digi digitization of the business, of the, the, the entire Blockbuster business. Blockbuster laughed them out of the room and the, the transaction never happened. It was it apparently happened. They were literally laughed at. Um, now, where we are today is Blockbuster are no longer and Netflix have a, a valuation of in excess of $80 billion. Um, now, a couple of points there. The first is Blockbuster probably didn't understand what business they were in. They thought they were probably in the business of DVD hire um, or home entertainment versus content distribution. So I think they fundamentally missed what they were in there. And if they truly understood their customer, if they truly um, uh, linked in with their customer, they would have understood what that was. And they would have also seen the emerging trends coming and they didn't see the value and the, 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 the how digitization was going to impact um, their business. And I throw it out there for any supply chain organization, because this is predominantly a supply chain um, audience. Um, you know, those organizations that aren't adopting digitization, that aren't adopting automation, um, that, are, that are not understanding what part they play in the entire value creation are going to find it very diff uh, difficult in times to come and, you know, run the risk, a great risk of becoming a blockbuster. Um, so just with that, I might pass, um, I might pass it back over to Tony now to, to, uh, to run a quick poll question. Sure, thanks Matt. So we've got a couple of polls today. Um, let me just launch this, sorry. So first poll today is, if you had the benefit of hindsight, what would you have done differently pre-COVID in terms of your commercial structure and disciplines? So the options are be very clear on why, what, and how your business strategy. Uh, build a governance framework that helps you control but doesn't paralyze. Measure the things that mattered most and not the things that didn't. Be ruthless on eliminating waste or all of the above. So if you guys wouldn't mind just answering those and we'll just wait for everyone to finish. And then we can see what uh, the group thinks. Right, we've just got a couple more to answer. Okay. Right, well, we're gonna cut it off here. Okay, so collectively, I think the, the biggest focus has been all of the above. I think all of them kind of resonate with everyone. Matt, what would your response be to this kind of thoughts? Yeah, I, look, there's, there's absolutely no right or wrong uh, answer, Tony. It's, it's, it's situational, right, depending on what's happening in um, everyone's organisations or, or everyone's circumstances. Um, and again, it makes, goes back to that point. It doesn't, all the, all the parts don't have to be perfect um, either, but there will certainly be some things that, um, that resonated with, with some more than others. Sure, okay. All right, well, thanks for that, guys. So, Matt, you can... Keep going, all right. So now, um, thanks, thanks for contributing to the, um, to the poll. Now we'll, um, we'll jump into the second attribute of the, of, the create mo uh, of the Fit for Disruption model. So remembering that there's three parts, there's commercial, create, and change. So we're dealing with the second part now. The create model, the first element of that is around, um, uh, around fostering an environment um, Sorry, I'm on the create model. Yeah, so creating a, um, fostering a, an environment that gives people 
um, the, the opportunity to create. What, I, what we see a lot in organisations, and, and we understand it because, you know, ironically, everyone's under commercial pressure, but it's not very commercial to, um, to not enable people to have the bandwidth to be able to work through, um, through solutions. So we see a lot in organisations where everyone's at about 120% capacity, they're putting out fires, they're, they don't have the right tools, they, they, um, they're frustrated, they're doing things off spreadsheets. Um, so, so you need to create, you know, and, and even workspaces. I mean, that's why one of the biggest um, benefits of doing a, a 5S lean program is so good. Just having a clean, clean, organised workspace becomes so so important, and that helps foster uh, foster a creative um, environment to think through solutions. The second is around developing a mindset. And, I, and I, we touched on this earlier before around COVID-19, and it's certainly going to be how we respond to the situation. If we, if we get ourselves caught up in how um, everything that's wrong with it, you know, and again, it's not to disregard that there's some serious consequences um, to, to many disruptions, including the COVID event. But if you can't, lift yourself up out of that and actually work through through it, then then you'll struggle. And, and, and then you need to be able to think about, you, you almost need an abundance mentality that you can get the, um, you can get the resources. I, have, I once had a, a boss that said to me, um, he said to me, Matthew, he asked me how many people had employed, you know, worked for, because I, I said, I've got all, I've got all this work to do. I've got no resources, all that sort of stuff. And he said, yeah, okay, how many people do you have? working for you. And I think I said something like, I don't know, however, however many people were working for me, were a direct report at the time. And he said, it's rubbish. He said, everyone works for you. He said, oh, I work for you. Um, you know, your service providers work for you. The CEO works for you. You just have to think broader and have an abundant mindset that, that if you, um, that, that all these resources are available. If you, if you um, can articulate um, your need for that in the right way. So being resourceful is very important. Um, then it's around being able to um, uh, understand that you're in the business of solving problems and that's why we're in business. We, we, we do business because we, we solve problems. So um, we need to be able to solve our customers' problems from their perspective, remembering that they're the ones that define value. Um, you know, it is about what they pay for um, and that's, that's how how value is ultimately, um, how ultimately it's, it's defined, but also, also not to be, you also need problem solving frameworks. And again, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate of lean. So that's where, you know, some of the, 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 the lean problem solving techniques are actually quite powerful because they, they give you a, um, they give you a strong framework to do it, but there's some more modern, um, uh, applications that can be used as well to, to, to help in that journey, which I touch on in the book as well. Um, and then fourth is about doing just, 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 you know, um, you, you learn by putting it out there and getting people to provide feedback and making it quick and iterative and, and just making it happen. If you, I used the example, I was reading an article recently and it was an emergency doctor or someone that was in charge of the, the, the emergency clinic at a hospital. And he was saying the enemy, the enemy of um, good emergency health care is perfection. He said, if, if people try and be perfect, um, it's too slow and people die. And, um, you know, and that, that resonates. And I think that resonates in a business environment um, as well. So that's the, um, the create model. So remember we had the foundations with commercial. Now this is about creating solutions and, and creating new ways of doing business. So, um, so that's, the, that's the second attribute. Um, the case study um, or, or the example I wanted to put up here is, is Flexport. And for those that don't know who Flexport are, they're a, um, it's an organisation founded by a guy named Ryan Peterson who lives in the Silicon Valley. Uh, Ryan Peterson is a serial entrepreneur, but he, um, he has no freight forwarding international trade experience at all. None. Zero zip. 
and he started a company um, that, for those that don't know, so Flexboard are a, a digital freight forwarder. Basically, that's what they are, digital freight forwarder. And they have a valuation in, a, in excess of $3 billion. So a guy has created with no international trade freight forwarding experience, a business worth over $3.2 billion. He makes the point that a hundred of the, the top 100 uh, freight forwarders in existence today um, were founded before Netscape was founded. And, and for those that don't know, it was a, a search engine that existed between 94 and 2003. So, um, so of the top 100 freight forwarders, um, none of them are new, only Flexport have come into that at the moment in a highly fragmented industry run by spreadsheets. Um, and and what, what was seen through the COVID uh, environment was that um, Flexport were quickly able to attract a whole, heap, a whole lot more customers because they already had the, the, the platform and capability to be able to, to respond to the, um, to, to the challenge. So um, there's, I'll give Tony a link actually, there's a great podcast where, where Ryan Peterson talks about um, his business and how they were created. The podcast was pre-COVID, so, um, but it's a very, very, very interesting listen. So I, I really encourage everyone. And, and, it, and it really, I think what it does is it really highlights the level of disruption that can come. And a lot of people, a lot of organisations are going, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to be um, so harsh and impactful. Well, Flexport's a great, a great example and, and why we should all um, uh, take, take warning. I guess. Okay, so then the, the third element of the fit for disruption model is um, change. So this is around making it happen, getting stuff done, um, not talking about it, doing it. Well, I mean, you have to do a little bit of talking about it. You have to do a little bit of planning. But if, you, if you're not actually spending 90% of your time doing then and, and making it happen, then something's wrong with, um, with, with your equation. Um, Leading the vision, leading the change effort, um, touch, you know, any great organisation has great leaders. Any change that happens has, you know, we touched on Flexport there before. That is because it is led by someone great, you know, Ryan Peterson. We don't all have to be Ryan Petersons or Steve Jobs, but we can all in our own right be good leaders. And if you take um, the situation at the moment, again, calm, decisive leadership um, is, is what's required and that can be quite comforting for people. And that which gives the second element, which is around giving people confidence. So in a normal change environment, that's, that's very, very much around um, people believing it can be done and why things like quick wins are so important. In an environment like today, it's, it's probably more going to be around making sure that people can see that there's a plan, people can see that there's a way through. And even if that's going to be uncomfortable, and even if the, even if the, the journey is, takes them to a place that is not as great as what it was pre-COVID, people are, um, are much more confident when they have an understanding of what's going on around them, even if that's not the best, best situation. You actually find it a lot with, um, even when people are redundant and so forth, people people are okay with the redundancy. They're not okay with the lack of lack of um, uh, planning and, and understanding that sits around it. Um, but but giving people confidence and giving people confidence of what they can do during um, during and after is is super important. The third element is empowering your people. When I talk about, mate, I touched before on leadership that you need calm but decisive leadership. Decisive leadership by no means means disempowering people and, and you making all the decisions. It probably actually means uh, means the opposite, but but it just means that you're able to decide very quickly. But people need the right tools. People need um, be, to be able to call upon the right resources as they need. People need to be trained. People need to be developed. Um, and, and people need on the job skill training and, and, and help them adapt to, to the environment that they're, that they're operating in. Um, and ultimately people, in particular frontline staff are the ones that are gonna have a better understanding of the customer, they're gonna have a better understanding of the problems that need to be solved. 
Then that leads then into the fourth element, which is around communication. There cannot be ever enough communication provided that communication is the right type of communication. We're seeing in times like at the moment, there's there's absolutely a saturation of information out there where people can't wait, uh, can't sort of see it. Um, but that's why if you have really, really clear, articulate communication that's consistent and, and, and good and, and meaningful, that becomes very, very powerful. And being creative in how you can get that message out there amongst all the noise is um, super important. And, and remembering that um, me communication is, is about the receiver of that and about what they understand. Just because you've delivered it and written an email or have a conversation with someone does not mean that it's been communicated. It's only communicated when it's understood. Um, and then fifth, no surprise, it's, um, it's around building the right team and having the right people on the bus doing the right things at the right time, um, making ensuring that those people are, are all culturally aligned. So that's... Um, and that's the change model. So I've been through the, 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 the entire Fit for Disruption model now, which was the commercial model, which was setting the foundation. Then it was the create model, which was around being able to develop and innovate new solutions. And then the third element to the model is around being able to change and, and make, make it happen. Um, so then the, the final, um, the final, uh, Kate, oh no, sorry, we're actually going to run to, uh, well, I'll throw it back to Tony so we can run the second uh, poll question. Sure. So thanks, Matt. So um, just curious to see what type of new businesses and service, oh, I should probably launch the poll, apologies. Um, so the question is, what type of new businesses and services will emerge in the supply chain industry as a result of the COVID disruption? So we've got uh, robotic solutions, solutions that solve customer problems and add value to all parties, digitization, data and visibility solutions, blockchain solutions, low tech, no tech warehousing. So if everyone can just take a second and give us their thoughts there, that'd be great. All right, so we're almost done. Just got a couple more. All right, okay. All right, we'll cut it here. Um, okay, so we got uh, a focus on solutions that solve customer problems and add value to all parties. I mean, that makes sense to me naturally. Matt, what are your thoughts? Again, it's a bit like um, like the first poll question. There's actually no right or wrong answer and it will be situational. So for some people, robotics will be very, very important or as would digitization. And, and I made the point before, if you're not looking at those things, you're probably going to be in a world of pain in time to come. Um, but sometimes equally though, we can, I see that often, you know, people go, oh, we need to get into artificial intelligence and blockchain and we need, I don't know, we need cryptocurrency, we need all this sort of stuff, we need, need to do it, do it, do it, do it. And, but I think often what happens is they don't understand why they're doing it and they don't understand how that actually is solving a problem that's actually adding value to a customer. So it's very important that regardless of what it is, if it is robotics, if it is digitization, blockchain, whatever it is, um, that it's solving problems. And that's why the last one there was around low tech, no tech warehouse. I mean, sometimes it doesn't require anything fancy. It just has to solve a problem, and 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 that's and that's um, that's really really important. But I do expect um, I do expect a lot uh, a lot of new businesses and services to be coming out uh, in the in the near future with um, those elements: robotics, digitization, data intelligence, and so forth. Cool. All right. Um, so the final case study, um, and I'll try and um, make this um, make this one quick, um, but it but it summarises, I think, perfectly a fit for disruption organisation. Um, 
I've had this chat to a lot of people that I that I know um, and that are that are um, that I rely on for for support and advice. And and when I wrote the book, I I, I said, oh God, how am I going to be able to publish this? In the first very first chapter, I'm talking about Qantas as the standout organisation, and here we are today, where they've actually stopped their operations, other than for a few humanitarian flights, um, and they've had to lay off, you know, 90% of their workforce. Da 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 da. Their major competitor, Virgin, as we know, is, um, you know, they're, they're suffering a world of pain, being an involuntary administration. But I think it actually makes the point, and, and the advice I got back was no, it actually makes the point nicely. Jet, um, Qantas have been able to do some really great things in an industry that is, forget COVID, is absolutely cutthroat. And if you just look at some of the examples, for instance, they, they started Jetstar to operate in the budget airline category. Um, they didn't want to distract away from their, their core business, but they were able to develop um, uh, Jetstar, and and um, that's that's now been a very successful airline, you know, and and operates um, all through the Asia Pac region quite heavily. Um, in two thousand and eleven, um, talking about being commercial, um, they were they grounded their entire fleet. So our national, the Australian national carrier, stopped flying planes to break an industrial dispute. They had to do that, you know, there might be some right or wrong reasons or people's own perspectives on whether that was the right answer. But, but what the, the point is there is that they were doing that to set themselves up for survival. They knew that if they kept going with the arrangements that they had in place, that they would not survive or they would not be able to deal with a shock um, or a disruption to the, uh, to the economy. Um, across the airline industry as a whole, there's, there's wonderful innovations. If you just think about the online, online check-ins, um, uh, pu putting your own uh, luggage, luggage through, they've got um, there's so many innovations that the, you know, even the Q tag for Qantas, um, that, that, you know, you don't even need to label your bag. So there's, there's all these wonderful um, wonderful innovations that they've that they've done they've entered into new spaces like insurance um, they offer insurance um, they've got their rewards program their frequent flyers so you want to talk about data analytics and the power of that or Qantas are, are, are very well um, uh, uh, positioned they've got their pilots academy that they they that they, they put 500 new pilots through and they in actual fact train pilots for other airlines as well um, and, and that's a bit of their give back, but then they're doing non-stop flights between Perth and Perth and London, or, or New York and Sydney. So they've never stopped giving up. And I'm I am absolutely certain that one of the reasons why Qantas um, ha have not collapsed now is because they did a lot of many good things over a long period of time um, to, to position themselves uh, well in a very very hard industry. So. Um, so that's uh, so that's Qantas, and they're in the yeah. As I said, the first chapter, which is which was quite interesting. All right, so we're we're sort of nearing the end. So thanks um, everyone for for your patience. I know that it's um, it, you know it, it's taken a while to get through this, um, but we we touched on I touched on it before about um, making it happen and 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 not just talking about it. And what I was really, really keen on doing today is was to, to set everyone a, a, a bit of a challenge. And what will happen is Tony and his team will send out a, a canvas to, to everyone that's on the call. Um, and on that canvas, it, it's, it's, just a, it's just a one page where, where it helps you focus on, on the opportunity of, um, of the current times. Now, in amongst it all, there has to be some opportunity, whether that is a different way of organising or structuring your business or operating your business. There may be an opportunity on offering a new, uh, a new service or a new product to your customer. Um, it may even be as broad as being able to do something for your community. You know, there, there's, there's opportunity in this. I can, I, um, um, again, my wife, she used the example, she's got someone in her team that actually owns a cocktail bar. That cocktail bar has been turned into a, um, a, a basic, for want of a better description, a, a soup kitchen for people that need, uh, need food. And 
they're, they're absolutely giving back and they've actually um, um, attracted a whole heap of investment and resource to be able to continue continue that that great work so a great opportunity has come through their um, through their heartache um, so Tony will um, Tony will send that out and and the thing that I want to do here is I'll make myself available so Tony will give my details my phone number we can set up a, a zoom meeting I can walk you through the canvas we can have a follow-up session to, to, to walk through what you found and how to help you how to help you achieve the um, how to help achieve the the opportunities. So I'll make myself available for that, and I'd only be too pleased to to be able to help and and um, you know get some real positivity out of the the current the current environment. So that pretty much I think concludes what I wanted to talk about with the Fit for Disruption book. And I just again want to thank everyone for your time. Um, and I think now we'll open it up to questions. I know Tony's got a few to kick off with, and we can open up to the group. Sure. No, thank, thanks, Matt. That was great. Um, so actually, we're going to probably start with the questions from the group just in conscious of time to so make sure we get to these first. So, uh, the first question we had was, how do you see the COVID impact in what you presented? Accelerate or slow down changes? Uh, it, 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 it's, a great, it's, it's a great question. And this was obviously what I struggled with about whether to publish it. It will accelerate it. Um, if, if you think of people that are um, uh, now, you know, getting used to, for instance, e-commerce and doing things online, working from home, buying things, you know, that, that, that will accelerate things. In terms of the framework, the framework is, is similar, you know, in this environment or, you know, we need to be commercial, we need to make hard decisions. So that those, those, the framework will exist in this disruption or any other disruption, but I think a lot of chain, I think warehousing operators, if I'm thinking about supply chain, I think if you think about all those freight forwarders, well, how many people have moved to, to Flexport? I mean, that will have to accelerate people's thinking in getting digital. Um, where robotics, you know, you, you will not be able to survive and pick the, the volume of e-commerce orders commercially if you want to do that with people. Um, it, it just won't. It just won't work. You're better off placing those people into into more um, useful roles. Sure, no good answer. Um, the other question from the group we had was, what is what is one key thing that you can see being different after COVID? What will be the new norm? So anything comes front of mind to you, Matt, around this is going to be changed exponentially moving forward? Yeah, this might be a surprise answer. Um, I actually, I actually think people will be more empathetic and I think people will be more conscious of each other and helping each other. Um, I think pre COVID people were in a bit of a spin and, you know, everyone does things all for the right reasons, but I think, uh, I believe a lot of people will actually reflect on how much we actually need each other to, to survive and to, um, and, and that will resonate in a business environment around you know, good supply. You know, I've seen really bad examples of, of companies making all sorts of threats and statements around how they're going to treat suppliers through this. Through this, so that's that's a very short-sighted um, focus. So I think people. I honestly believe people will be more humanistic, empathetic, and work with each other. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think I've I've seen a number of examples where. Um, it's very clear the value in the relationship people place, depending on the way they communicate with you as well. So to your point around company managing this, a partnership model, or they're just giving them directions with no opportunity to discuss what the actual solution is. I mean, that it's quite clear that there's been a number of examples. Absolutely. And can I just say that is where the power of innovation will come from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to ask and just share with the group. So, and this is, Having done a number of papers for uni, um, really struggling to get started, what was the hardest part about actually writing the book? How, what was the hardest part about getting started? <laughs> um, you know, this is certainly one of those ones, Tony, where it's take your own advice, you know, I have to read it. It, it, it's, it was very much just starting, just doing it. Um, you know, my, I, I know I've had this conversation with you before, one of the, pr the proudest moments I've had in my life came through recently where my daughter sent out a, um, uh, you know, basically a congratulations 
message about about my book and she spoke about how I've been talking about writing a book for the last 10 years. The reality was the book didn't actually take long to write. Um, I just had to start and 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 not be not fear failure and not fear the judgment. Just just do it, try it, improve it, take it to people, get people to give feedback. Everyone wants to help. It was it was it was actually a remarkable process for, for that perspective. And 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 but to answer your question directly, it's just get started, do something, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, that is the hardest part, actually, just getting started. The concept is one thing, but it's the execution, right? So, um, but yeah, just from my own personal experience, that I always found that difficult putting pen to paper. Um, but that's, that's another topic for another day. I did also want to ask you around influencing stakeholders. You talk about leadership. You talk about uh, building that skill set to, to drive change and to guide change. I've always been fascinated around influencing capability, and I think the need for the ability to get people to do what you need them to do in a business setting given the current climate what would you what would be the one skill set that you would give supply chain professionals now or, or recommend they look at when it comes to improving their influencing capability yeah look it's another it's another great question and i think i'd love to answer it with one if i have to answer it with one you you, you need cultural alignment so if you have if you have people on different paths or just different value sets it is going to make conversations very difficult and you're just butting your head against the wall. So that's either an organisation that has has people in the organisation that are not a culturally, you know, fit, but equally some people might be in organisations that don't align to their values. And if you're cons consistently having conversations and butting your head against the wall, I, I believe most likely it's because, uh, and, and if you can't influence, it's likely because you don't have an alignment in values to, um, to start with but equally but but then just to extend on that you do need to give people that's very much that empowerment and making sure people have the tools and the training and being able to have the space to be able to articulate um yeah. communicate rather than be you know um ill prepared ill uh, you know don't have the right tools and equipment and and then and then makes it very difficult to influence Sure. No, absolutely. And look, the final question, I know we've dragged on for probably longer than we anticipated, so appreciate everyone sticking around. Uh, last question I wanted to ask was, obviously tech, tech is the, the buzzword, digitization, embracing technology. Uh, you, you talk about it in your book, Matt, around the ability to um, embrace intelligence gathering and intelligence capability through technology within a business. Do you see that embrace or that willingness to try or ingrain tech further into business as a generational trait or do you see that across all <laughs> I reckon that's brilliant right? that's <laughs> that is that is such a cool question and I'll tell you why it's cool um, you look at Facebook right the people that are most that that stalk me the most on Facebook are my parents and my aunties and uncles and they're all in their 70s yeah so, <laughs> so yeah. You, you can't it's you know if people or my wife's boss you know they they you know they, they will do it that any generation is capable of doing it if they have a need to do it if they want to do it if there's a why right it's 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 like anything we, we can train now the only difference to that tony is obviously my you know um i think i had a commodore 64 was the first thing i used i, I can't even remember but my children have you know, iPads and computers and, you know, apples or whatever it might be. You know, my, my father had a, their mother had a typewriter, you know, so, and they're going to be brought up in different educational environments. So there will be a gap in that, but there won't be a loss of appetite to, to adopt it provided there's a why. Mm. Okay, well, that's fair enough. I guess just the, the question comes from supply chain logistics, having this kind of stereotype of being, an old school function in terms of behaviors and that there's a that gap and that change and that dynamic shifting through the the new wave of leadership that comes through as well and obviously yeah. what, what i'll what i'll say though to that though tony is if that you're not prepared to adopt or your people are not prepared to adopt that type of mindset and mentality that yep. that is part of our new world then you then then that, that's going to be very tough going sure Okay. Well, look, I am um, conscious of time. I, I think we're going to wrap it up here. So I wanted to say thanks again, Matt, for taking the time to, to run this through with us. I really do like the book. I highly recommend everyone go 
go find it. Now we're, we're going to send out follow-up emails with the recording, with the links for the book, where to buy it as well, if you're interested and Matt's contact details for those who'd like to have a conversation with Matt about anything relating to today or just generally life as, as a whole. Yeah, um, and, and the opportunity like in taking on that challenge, I think that's important, you know, more than happy to help. Yeah. We'll send that, uh, the, the schematics through as well. So, um, thanks again, everyone, and we're going to end it here, and I hope have a, everyone has a great weekend, and uh, stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. See you, guys. Thank you.